I'm going to begin where I think every conversation of sexual assault in college should begin, with an exploration of today's concept of masculinity. You know, when I ask students, what does it mean to be a real man? They, the, you know, the responses are almost identical whether they're in seventh grade or seniors in high school, or seniors in high school or seniors in college. Um, you know, real men are tough, they're athletic, they're strong, they're in control, they drink beer, and they drive trucks. Guys who don't live up to that standard are emotional, they're weak, they're, you know, they care too much about things. They drive Priuses and wear skinny jeans, whatever that means. And then finally, when asked, um, you know, what do we call other guys who exhibit those latter characteristics, the words that I receive are always gay, pussy, bitch, fag, queer, vagina. So just by asking that simple question of what does it mean to be a man, we already see this, you know, distancing, this separation between us as guys and others, you know, and we kind of keep our distance there. And, you know, we see them almost as below us because when you think about the words that I mentioned, you know, the two worst things a guy can call another guy are some variation of gay or a woman. So what does that tell us about how we view those two groups of people? So ask, again, defining that question of a real man <coughs> um, shows us the constant pressure that us as guys are under to be seen as sort of manly or at least confining to this idea of what it means to be a guy. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm a guy and I wear my deodorant, my deodorant and my Old Spice deodorant, and I, and I drink with my friends, and I'm athletic, and, you know, I'm popular with the ladies, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm, I'm within that concept. But as soon as I start kind of stepping a little bit outside, and I'm a little emotional or you know, vulnerable or do something a little bit different from what ex what's expected, I'm called one of those many words, oh, stop being such a pussy, and then push right back into the box. You know, guys are under this constant pressure to prove themselves from a very early age. Everything from avoiding any toy that could be seen as girly to, you know, the, the cyberbullying that we see in, in high schools where one guy will, um, you know, display a false image of himself as controlling and powerful at the, extent, at the expense of another of his classmates. You know, and athletes especially are inundated with these messages because being athletic is so central what it, to what it means to be in this box and everyone kind of expects that all those other things around in the man box um, will accompany being athletic. Um, so the problem is not necessarily for me what's in the box. Being a guy is not a bad thing. I love being a guy. But the, you know, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with driving a truck. Being athletic is a great characteristic. It's healthy. And so is responsibility. The pressure that we're under to be in here in this box all the time is the issue for me. Because when we look at all those characteristics of a quote-unquote real man, um, it's impossible to stay within that definition. And if it's impossible to stay in that box all the time, we're saying it's impossible to live up to that standard that we've set of what it means to be a guy. You know, my experience turning to me, when I first saw this exercise called the man box that I'm describing in Professor Tapp, Mark Tappan's class here at Colby College, it was a hugely freeing experience for me because I grew up playing soccer and I ski raced and athletics was and still is a huge part of my identity. Um, and in a lot of ways I fit into this, into this space. But at the same time, I had massive glasses and a perfect bowl cut until sophomore year of high school. I was certainly not your, you know, your high school player. I was really shy. I loved school and I often felt more comfortable with my female friends. But at the same time, my membership on the soccer team kind of 
categorize me as being in this, in this box, this space. So I was kind of caught in limbo, but when I, when I saw this man box exercise, I said, oh, it's okay. I can be the athlete, the star athlete, and the nice guy that I always want to be. I can be fiercely competitive and, you know, emotional, sensitive, all those attributes that I really care about. Um, you know, and just trying to return back towards college, often we as guys in college categorize or justify our membership within this space of masculinity by how much we can drink, with the stunts we pull off when we're drunk, and how many girls we can have sex with. You know, the, it's such a heteronormatively charged atmosphere, right? Um, with, uh, <coughs> just think about the morning debrief sessions, for instance, Sunday mornings, Sunday morning. And you know, one guy tells a story, sets the standard, but then as soon as some other friend tells a more absurd story or more, um, you know, something more noteworthy, that initial storyteller is kind of put back under the microscope and all of a sudden finds himself on this precipice between being the man and being sort of distanced as an other. Um, and as a young college student, especially a male, it's really easy in that type of atmosphere to start thinking, what's wrong with me? You know, everyone else seems to be having sex, and, that's, and I hear these stories, but why am I not getting some? You know, so that's the anxiety that I'm, that I'm talking about. And when, you know, male, being male does not necessarily mean a certain, a certain set of standards. And um, there are certainly men who are uh, victims of sexual violence in college. They're, they are there, they can be, and they are. However, the ma vast majority of perpetrators of sexual assault are male. Why is this? You know, I think if we take the perspective of a college male, especially if he finds himself within you know, all male spaces, like sports teams or fraternities, um, where the man box is sort of so dominant, it's a little bit easier to understand. First of all, you have that huge amount of anxiety that I mentioned um, about, being this, about being in the box, but also that, like, oh, what's wrong with me? I'm not having sex. You have that huge amount of anxiety. Then you have this hierarchy starting between men and women where basically based on those words that we mentioned, right, the two worst things a guy can call another guy, one of which being a woman, but also the vast number of uh, media images of women as sexual objects, whether that's in mainstream film or with porn, which in so many ways kind of st is the standard of guys' sexuality and sex. That's sort of what they think it is. So you have this hierarchy starting. And then finally, there's this expectation that guys are going to have sex in college. Um, and when that, that expectation is there, almost you get this sense of, I, like, entitled to have sex. And so when you're not having, having sex and when you have this sense of entitlement and you don't have to think with, um, about ever being sexually assaulted because of our male privilege, that's a really toxic recipe of that hierarchy, the anxiety, and the entitlement. That's a really toxic recipe that I think, given a side of alcohol, could lead to something like sexual violence. You know, so how do we disrupt this? How do we change this picture of, of sexual assault in college, but also the, the, you know, the masculine stereotypes and the pressures that we're under? I think there are very, various ideas of how to change culture in college. Uh, but I think one key lies in working with male athletes. You know, um, there, male athletes have a huge amount of social Pre social power, excuse me, social power um, in our society at large, but also on college campuses. And often that power is used in negative ways or, you know, to get away with negative behaviors, often because of the pressure that they're under to be sort of seen as the man. You know, that's, that's how they, they often will, 
will exhibit those behaviors. But it's only a small percentage of guys and male athletes who are actively dictating and perpetrating those behaviors and enforcing them. You know, the vast majority of guys are in the middle of a spectrum between your picture of hegemonic masculinity and your guy leading the charge to end violence against women. Most guys are somewhere in the middle, but be, they shift towards the negative side of masculinity because of the social power that resides there. And remember, those type of behaviors will also um, win you sort of membership and a sense of belonging within your, this male space. So that's why I conduct conversations with male athletes and guys about their gender, assu gender assumptions and um, raising awareness of sexual assault. I think that if we can kind of talk with guys about those things, we're going to relieve the huge amount of anxiety that boys feel and you know, have that freeing, that freeing experience that I did, but also you know, build empathy within, within guys to kind of close that distance between each other and um, you know, between the guys and everyone outside. So <clears throat> that's, that's why I do what I do. And I think if we conduct these peer-to-peer -peer conversations that question those things, we can amplify the healthy voices within men who are in the middle but might not be able to share that because of the pressures that they're under. If we can amplify the healthy voices within guys who would normally shift this direction toward the negative behaviors, if we can amplify their voices, we can shift that social power towards the guys who exhibit the compassion, the empathy, the leadership, and the courage that's needed to expand past this definition of what we see as a guy. You know, if we can amplify those voices in the middle, who would normally shift this direction because of the social power, we can isolate the, you know, the guys on this side of the spectrum and because all of a sudden we'll shift their power towards the guys exhibiting all those great characteristics and hopefully then um, set the tone of that's where our masculinity lies, not in those negative behaviors. Um, so thinking about sport, there's inherent leadership, accountability, and courage within sport. And I think these are hugely key to this, this effort that we're involved in. And male athletes are certainly not the only ones that can show those traits. And much of the work that I do is actually starts from a foundation of years and years of courageous women doing the same talks that I'm doing now. And I'm so thankful to the, those groups beforehand. However, can you imagine if we could use the transformative power of sport that so many athletes, and especially male athletes, well, so many athletes, identify with and love as a way to change how we see our community? That for me is just so exciting as a way to make this social change. You know, talking openly and emotionally with men and boys about gender pressures, about sexual assaults, already deviates from what we see as being, you know, manly. It already deviates, it already deviates from the expectations that we have of guys and male sports teams. But I expect more. I expect that if we can conduct these conversations within those male spaces, that we can free guys from that emotionally suffocating and anxious cloak of masculinity, we can raise awareness of sexual assault, and yes, I think if these conversations become commonplace, I do think we can prevent sexual assault in college. Thank you. <laughs>